Hey everybody, happy holidays. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Quick, and today I will be talking to you about high yield cardiology concepts. For those joining us for the first time, this is a channel that covers content on the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1 exams. We provide you hundreds of high yield questions with explanations for the premium price of zero dollars and zero cents. So sit back, grab a cup of hot cocoa, and let's do some cardiology. Let's just review the method that we've been practicing since our very first video. You always want to read the last one or two sentences of the question stem, then the answer choices, and then you can read the question from the beginning once you know what the hell they want you to know. Let's try this for question one. Now, most questions in step one are usually a bit longer than this, but let's just try to get into the habit of practicing the method because it will save you in the long run. So we can begin reading from where I bolded for you. He is diaphoretic, dyspneic, and can barely speak in full sentences. His heart rate is 87 per minute, blood pressure is 170 over 100, and respiratory rate is 17 per minute. What is the best first test in the management of this patient? A. Serum hepatic enzyme levels. B. Electrocardiogram. C. Serum lactic acid. D. Troponin T. Or E. Troponin I. I know we're in the cardiology section, but you should always try to identify the topic first. This seems like a cardiorespiratory issue just from the limited amount of information we've read so far. This is also backed up by the answer choices mostly pertaining to cardiology. So we kind of have a general idea as to what this question is getting at. Now we can read the rest of the question. A 51-year-old man comes to the emergency department an hour and a half after the onset of severe chest pain that radiates to his jaw and left arm. And we know from what we just read before what his other symptoms and signs are. So in order to determine the best test for this patient, we have to come up with the most likely diagnosis and know what test is the best initial first test. Now, whenever you see those words, best first test or best initial test, I want you to mentally replace that with best screening test, since we typically learn it that way. Okay, so I think we are ready to try and answer this question. What are we most concerned for in this patient? You should be saying myocardial infarction, right? That is what we are most worried about in this patient who is having acute onset radiative chest pain, diaphoresis, and dyspnea. So what is the go-to screening test for that? And hopefully you're saying B, electrocardiogram. Okay, good job. Let's do this next question together. I'm going to start reading from where it says surface ECG. Surface ECG shows Q waves and ST elevations in leads 2, 3, and AVF. ST segment depressions are present in V2 and AVL. Serum troponin measurement is elevated. Already, just from reading that, we know that this patient is most likely experiencing an inferior wall myocardial infarction. Remember, ST segment elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF is highly suggestive of a STEMI for the right coronary artery. Right, so we're having right coronary artery ischemia, which affects the inferior wall of the heart. Those are the jumps we've made to get to inferior wall MI. They want to know what is the mechanism that is involved in this patient's condition. A, ruptured plaque, B, coronary artery thromboembolism, C, valvular stenosis, D, vasospasm of small coronary vessels, or E, coronary steel syndrome. So without even reading from the beginning of the question, we are able to collect a lot of information. Now, if you really wanted, you could try to answer the question with just the information that we've read so far. As you are reading the answer choices, you should be trying to evaluate each answer to see if it is associated with what you were able to extract from the portion of the question that we've already read. Since we know this patient is most likely experiencing an inferior wall MI, the only thing required to know is the pathophysiology behind it, which we should already have reviewed. So in case you didn't review, today's your lucky day. We'll do a very superficial level review of all of that. We know that the myocardial infarction mainly stems from atherosclerotic disease. In order for that to happen, we have to have an oxidized LDL depositing in the vessels and atheromatous plaque forming as a result with a fibromuscular cap. If it just stops there and is occluding greater than 75% of the vessel diameter, that is the description for stable angina. In stable angina, you will have chest pain on exertion because there's decreased oxygen being delivered to the myocytes, but there still is blood going through, so the myocytes won't start dying quite yet. This means that in stable angina, you will not see elevated troponin levels as that is the marker for when myocytes die and spill their contents into the blood. Now, if that atheromatous plaque ruptures, a clot or a thrombus will form over that area and can rapidly occlude greater than 90% of the vessel diameter. If that happens, it is considered unstable angina. You will still have normal levels of troponin since the cells are not dying yet, as they are still receiving some blood flow, but the patient will have anginal chest pain at rest. An NSTEMI, right, a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, is very similar to unstable angina, but it has been present longer and or it occludes more of the vessel diameter. Now, this is actually when the myocytes start to die off and you begin to see elevation in the troponin within the serum. 
you also see ST depression on EKG as the full wall of the heart is not being affected yet, but you do have portions of the heart being affected. Like it's not receiving enough oxygen. So you see some myocytes uh, start to die off and spill out troponin into the blood. And finally, we'll talk about the most serious, a STEMI, or an ST elevation myocardial infarction. It is a full occlusion due to a thrombus formation after a ruptured plaque. It causes elevation of cardiac enzymes such as troponin and CKMB, and you will see ST elevations on EKG. So the answer would be A, a ruptured plaque, as we know that this patient is experiencing a myocardial infarction and that that rupturing of the plaque is part of the pathogenesis of this condition. So just to go over the other answer choices quickly so you can associate them with their respective conditions. A coronary artery thromboembolism is when a clot breaks off elsewhere in the body and is thrown over to the coronary vessels. This usually happens in the setting of a vegetation on one of the cardiac valves or as a result of a messed up electrical activity of the heart, which leads to blood not moving well and increasing the chance for a clot to form. Atrial fibrillation is a very common cause of cardiac originating clots that can be tossed off to the systemic circulation, including the coronary vessels. Valvular stenosis can cause syncope, anginal pain, and dyspnea, but it does not cause occlusion of the coronary vessels, which is what gives you the ST segment changes on EKG and elevated troponin level. Phasospasm of small coronary vessels is also known as Prince metal angina. You will probably see it in a question about some guy who begins to have chest pain at rest while he is in bed watching TV, or somebody who does a lot of cocaine. What is happening is exactly what the answer choice says. The coronary vessels are spasming, which reduces blood flow and causes diffuse ST elevations on EKG. And finally, coronary steel syndrome is a phenomenon where there is already underlying coronary artery disease. So there is already decreased blood flow through one of the coronary vessels and you give a vasodilator. And the vessels around the ischemic area vasodilate while the ischemic area is still not being supplied well because there is stenosis there. So you're actually redirecting more blood away from the ischemic area or the area that needs more of the oxygen because it's oxygen deprived. And that will further shunt the blood from the poorly perfused area to the good areas, which exacerbates the condition and causes you know, more ischemia. Okay, I know that was a long one, but that is an extremely high yield concept that you will definitely, definitely see on your board exams. Let's move on to question three. I'll give you a second to pause me and try out the method yourself. When you unpause me, I will read the question from start to finish and discuss how I get to the answer. So feel free to pause me now. I'll give you a second to do so before I start speaking. Okay, so I will read it quickly. A 17-year-old girl who participates on the track team at her school comes to the clinic for medical clearance. She is very active at a healthy body weight for her height and is in overall good health. As you progress through the physical examination, you auscultate her heart and appreciate a loud S1 heart sound. You also note that the S2 heart sound is markedly split and non-changing with either inhalation or exhalation. Which of the following is most likely responsible for this patient's cardiac finding? A. Patent ductus arteriosus. B. Failed formation of aorticopulmonary septum. C. Epstein's anomaly. D. Endocardial cushion defect. Or E. Aplasia of the interatrial septum. Okay, so what do we know? We know that this patient's defect must generate a loud S1 and fixed split S2. So what causes this? Well, if you don't know, let's just go through the answer choices anyway. So what does a PDA cause, right? A patent ductus arteriosus. What does it cause? So it causes a continuous machine-like murmur. Okay, so that's not what we were hearing in the description, right? We're hearing a fixed split S2 heart sound. How about failed formation of aortic pulmonary septum? Well, this is also known as truncus arteriosus, which is a combined outflow tract involving both the aorta and pulmonary artery. You have a normal S1, but a loud single S2 heart sound, which is not what we see in the question. So we know that can't be the answer either. How about Epstein's anomaly? Well, so Epstein's anomaly is a result of maternal lithium use during pregnancy. It causes atrialization of the right ventricle, which for all intents and purposes sounds like tricuspid regurgitation. This does not produce a fixed split S2 heart sound as it would cause a holosystolic murmur. How about endocardial cushion defect? Well, an endocardial cushion defect is an abnormality of the heart where the central part that normally divides it into four chambers is defective. The valve separating the atria and the ventricles are also messed up. A complete endocardial cushion defect typically has both an ASD, that is to say an atrial septal defect, and a VSD, a ventricular septal defect. A partial is typically atrial septal defect primum type, which has a very high correlation with Down syndrome. The fixed split S2 heart sound in the patient is characteristic of an atrial septal defect. However, as she does not have signs of a VSD or prior history of Down syndrome, the better answer would actually be, in this case, E, aplasia of the interatrial septum, as that is the case for a sole pure atrial septal defect. Keep in mind, if it says failure of fusion, they're most likely talking about a patent foramen ovale. That's different. 
if they're talking about aplasia, or in other words, the tissue is not present at all, then it is atrial septal defect, which produces a fixed split S2. So once again, this answer would be E, aplasia of the interatrial septum. All right, great job with that one. I always thought that that type of question was particularly difficult. Let's give the next one a shot. I put it up on your screen, so go ahead, pause me, and try to do the method for this question. Okay, so hopefully you got the answer. Uh, let's read through really quickly. A three-year-old child is brought into the primary care office by his mother. She is concerned because he has had a fever of 103 degrees Fahrenheit, red eyes, and has recently developed a rash on his palms and soles. On physical examination, you note that the patient's tongue has a deep red hue to it and that his anterior cervical lymph nodes are enlarged. What medication is most appropriate for this patient? A. Acetaminophen B. Cyclophosphamide C. IVIG and aspirin D. Acyclovir E. Penicillin So what do we know about this patient? He is an infant, he has a fever of 103, he has red eyes, he has a rash on the palms and soles, a red tongue, and anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. What condition presents like this in an infant? Well, perhaps these symptoms look very familiar, almost as if there's a beautiful mnemonic that sums it up perfectly. If you don't know this mnemonic yet, I would highly recommend memorizing it. It shows up all the time. The mnemonic is crash and burn, and I put it up on your screen. So this is a mnemonic for Kawasaki's disease, which primarily affects children four years or younger. In crash and burn, C stands for conjunctivitis, or reddening of the eyes. R stands for rash, usually one that desquamates on the soles and palms. A stands for adenopathy of cervical lymph nodes. S stands for strawberry tongue, which is essentially saying that there's a red tongue with little punctations on it. H stands for hand swelling and erythema. And burn, right, the word burn is just there to remind you of fever, as in you are burning up. So this kid pretty much has all those signs, but the question asks for the most appropriate treatment. So which one is the answer for treatment of Kawasaki's disease? So for Kawasaki disease, it is a very peculiar instance because in this case you actually give C, IVIG, and aspirin. And you do this because the patient in this case is prone to coronary artery aneurysm. So you want to prevent against that happening. In addition, this is one of the only times where you give a child aspirin. Remember, if you give a child aspirin for a viral illness, they may develop a Ray syndrome, which can be fatal. But in this case, we are more than happy to risk that to prevent a coronary aneurysm. So once again, the answer to this is C, IVIG, and aspirin. And if you do not know that mnemonic, I would definitely commit it to memory. All right, let's look at the next question. Same deal here. Pause this one and try it on your own, and then we will go over it. Okay, so hopefully you're ready. Let's tackle this one together. The process of atherosclerosis begins with endothelial dysfunction that leads to scavenger A1 receptors on macrophages taking up and creating a fatty streak in vessels. Multiple factors are secreted, which forms a fibromuscular cap over the atheroma, which is eventually weakened by the upregulation of metalloproteases. Once ruptured, the plaque becomes a nidus for thrombus formation. What cells are responsible for the generation of the fibromuscular cap in atherosclerosis? A. Adipose cells, B. Platelets, C. Endothelial cells, D. Smooth muscle cells, or E. All of the above. Okay, so this question is really just seeing how much you know about the process of atherosclerosis formation. Since this is the cardiology unit and that is the big condition for everything cardiology, you gotta just beat it into your brain. And this is an either you know it or you don't type of question, which you will see some on step one. So the formation of the fibromuscular cap in an atherosclerotic plaque is due to the smooth muscle cells. So choice D is the correct answer. Weirdly enough, platelet-derived growth factor is secreted in the region of the atherosclerotic plaque which even more weirdly promotes the migration of smooth muscle cells to the top layer, which generates the fibromuscular cap. So just remember, fibromuscular, you have smooth muscle cells there. This cap will rupture once metalloproteases are released, which would allow for thrombus formation. But as it pertains to the question, they just want to know the cell responsible for the fibromuscular cap, and that is the smooth muscle cells. So we have two more questions left. If you feel overwhelmed or you need to just take a break, feel free to pause me take a break and then come back here and we'll continue, okay? For the rest of you, let's try to knock these two questions out quickly so you can get on with your life. Since they are short, I will be reading them in full, out loud, and going over how to approach them. A 27-year-old man presents to the clinic with a recent change in his vision status. He is six feet, five inches tall, 180 pounds, and has normal skin complexion. His father passed away at 53 years old due to a cardiac issue. There is no past medical history or familiar history of any thyroid conditions. What would you expect to hear on cardiac auscultation? A, a mid-systolic click murmur that improves with squatting. B, a fixed split S2 heart sound. C, a diastolic decrescendo murmur over left upper sternal border. D, a crescendo decrescendo murmur over the right second intercostal space. Or E, 
a diastolic murmur with an opening snap. So before we talk about the different types of murmurs and what they sound like, whenever you see a death due to a cardiac problem in a patient's relatives, you should always kind of consider causes such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, electrical abnormalities, congenital long QT syndromes like Romano Ward or Jervil Lang Nielsen syndrome. I always mispronounce it, so JLN for short, and Marfan syndrome, as those can all be related to genetic inheritance. In this patient's case, we know that he is tall and his vision changes. This is most consistent with what condition? Hopefully you should be saying Marfan syndrome. If you're really a gunner, you can also have a Marfanoid body habitus in men 2 b and homocysteineuria. In those cases though, you would see other symptoms like mucosal neuromas, medullary thyroid carcinoma, and pheochromocytoma in the case of men 2 b syndrome, or recurrent thrombotic disease in the case of homocysteineuria. It should be noted that homocysteineuria, like Marfan's, does present with vision changes as the lens is in a different configuration. However, unlike Marfan's, homocysteineuria has the lens being displaced inferiorly and inwards, while Marfan's has the lens being displaced superiorly and outwards. I know it doesn't sound like a big difference, but sometimes boards does actually make this distinction. However, here we see that we don't need to make that distinction because all the answer choices have to do with a murmur, which should point us towards Marfan's anyway. So, what heart defect is associated with Marfan syndrome? Hopefully you're saying mitral valve prolapse. Remember, another way they can say this is by saying uh, mitral valve redundancy or myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve. Right, those are all different ways to say the same thing, right? Mitral valve prolapse. So which one of these murmurs is hallmarked for mitral valve prolapse? All of you are hopefully saying A, a mid-systolic click murmur that improves with squatting or that improves with increased preload. Only mitral valve prolapse and the murmur from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy improve with increased preload. Remember, when we say a murmur improves, we are saying that it becomes quieter. Sometimes people forget that or they mistake it for it actually gets louder. Okay, now just for completeness sake, let's go over all the other murmurs that are listed. B is associated with an atrial septal defect as we saw in the other question. C is associated with aortic regurgitation. D is associated with aortic stenosis. And E is associated with mitral stenosis. Okay, let's finish up with this beautiful EKG. For all of you budding cardiologists out there, you will love this one. Whenever you see a question like this, oftentimes you can get the answer just by looking at the image. So let's analyze this image before reading the question. What do you see here? So if you have no idea where to start, here's a good way to do it. You should always start by estimating rate and then evaluating the rhythm. I know they always say, you know, rate rhythm axis. Uh, boards doesn't ever really test you on axis. It's a little bit more advanced. Uh, step one and level one do not expect you to really be too well versed in difficult EKG strips, so they're not going to really give you a, a difficult rhythm. They'll usually give you something that's clean and common. When trying to estimate the rate, it is easiest to look at what kind of strip you have. If it does not give you the time interval, you can't do that little trick where you sum up the QRS complexes and multiply. So you may have to do the other method where you look at how many big boxes there are between each QRS complex. One big box between is a rate of 300, two between is 150, 3 is 100, 4 is 75, 5 is 60, and 6 is 50. And I just put that on your screen so that you know, hopefully you're able to memorize that. So we see here that there's about four big boxes in between, which indicates a heart rate of about 75 beats per minute, which falls within the normal range. Now we want to evaluate the rhythm. And we do so by checking to see if there's normal P waves before every QRS complex. And we want to make sure that there's a P wave for every QRS complex. It is here that we find the abnormality. I've highlighted some P waves for you, and you will notice that the last one I highlighted does not have a corresponding QRS. This is indicative of a heart block, which blocks conduction between atrium ventricles. If you want to just confirm this, you want to also look for a prolonged PR, right? And that is also demonstrated here, but I think that the way that I was telling you is probably a little bit faster. Now, knowing that this patient has a heart block, specifically a Mobitz type 2 heart block, let's read the question and see what they want. A 45-year-old woman presents to the emergency department with noticeable confusion, fatigue, and joint pain. Her husband states that she had a red rash on her a few weeks ago, which went away. This patient's EKG is shown below. What part of the patient history would be most helpful in determining her condition? A. Smoking history. B. Sexual history. C. Outdoor activity. D. Recreational drug use. Or E. Current medications. So this patient has a history of a rash and is now confused, fatigued, and has joint pain, and has a heart block. So what could this be? 
Okay, hopefully you are saying to me Lyme carditis, right? Heart block from Borrelia burgdorferi. So this could be stage two or stage three of Lyme disease, uh, but you, when you see joint pain, you see heart block, you know, confusion, lethargy, you typically want to start thinking of at least possible Lyme exposure. So if that is the case, right, if we're assuming Lyme in this case, what part of the history would play the biggest role? And I hope you are saying outdoor activity because Lyme disease comes from the ixodes tick after it has been attached for 24 to 36 hours. If you were able to get that, you should be very happy with yourself. I thought that was very difficult. Sometimes, you know, if you're not primed for these things, you don't think of them. If Lyme carditis didn't immediately come to your head, don't worry. This is why we are doing questions now so that you can get those points later. Well, that's it for today, everyone. Oh, oh, wait, I forgot. We have one more bonus question just for the holidays. Let me play a clip of it now, and then we'll read together. Then, when in Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day, So, we have an elderly green male presenting to your office, smiling and giving out presents to the patients in your waiting room. He complains that he now knows the true meaning of Christmas. Chest x-ray shows that his heart has tripled in size since his last visit. What is the next best step? A. Spreading Christmas cheer by singing loud for all to hear. B. Diagnosing the Grinch with acute dilated cardiomyopathy. C. Taking time away from studying to spend it with your loved ones. D. Recreational eggnog use. Or E. All of the above. Now, don't panic. I know this looks like a very difficult question, but let's just go through the facts that we know so far. You have been studying for who knows how many years without any time for breaks, relaxing, or going out. Unless your exam is coming up within the next few weeks, please take time to focus on investing in yourself and enjoying the holidays. Anki, Dirty Medicine, Golion, First Aid, Pathoma, Boards and Beyond, Sketchy, and yours truly are not going anywhere. So naturally, this answer is going to be E, all of the above. If you enjoyed this little holiday special, all we ask is that you hit that like button and share this video with other medical students who can use a bit of Christmas cheer. We believe all medical students already pay way too much for resources that should already be free. Especially now, between COVID, step one being pass-fail, and now, Comlex level one going pass-fail. Anyway, what are you still doing on this video? Go out, enjoy your holidays, have a Merry Christmas, and I'll see you next time.